Hey there, everybody. It's Mark at MGC Custom Puzzles, uh, mgcpuzzles.com and custommadepuzzles.com, bringing you a new video today. Uh, it's an image that I actually cut in a video in the past. I just realized, uh, unfortunately, I uh, kind of covered this puzzle up uh, for an unexpected period of time and uh, need to get this thing finished. So I'm going to be cutting this today on video and chatting with you guys. Uh, unfortunately, I still can't make live videos just yet. But uh, I'm going to make some commentary. Hopefully it's a, something of interest. And if, uh, if any of you have any comments, please put them down below in the comment area of the video. And I'll be more than happy to respond in a future point in time uh, to whatever it is you've got to say. So uh, thanks a bunch. And let's, uh, let's get this going. I, uh, I have a bit of a new setup here, so I'm kind of excited about that. And we'll switch it over to our three-way uh, camera here. And... Uh, Let's just put on some, some finger cuts and get rolling and actually crank up the light. It's actually kind of dark down here at the moment, but now it's super bright. And I know that all the lenses, all these modern cameras, you got to love how they, uh, they just automatically adjust. Hope everybody's doing well with this uh, situation in the world, hunkering down. I've been uh, extremely hunkered down for actually yesterday was officially four weeks. I have been out, but very briefly, only to do essential grocery shopping and essential errands, and I've uh, been very safe about how I, uh, how I handle myself. So uh, I have a beautiful respirator. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I, uh, I'm in the business of sawdust and uh, occasionally painting, so I own uh, some N95 respirators, and including those, uh, those lovely almost like Darth Vader uh, canister ones. So I use the canister one when I go to the grocery store. I'm trying to think of a way to make it look a little more presentable. So I'm going to use a hot glue gun and uh, I might doctor it up almost as if I'm like going to Burning Man or something like that, which by the way, today uh, was uh, officially uh, canceled for the year 2020. So uh, sad to hear that, but it totally makes sense and I'm glad they're being safe about it. So, all right, let's start doing some cutting and oh, Big news. Switched out my saw with one of my other saws. Notice how quiet it is. I don't know why I didn't try to do this earlier. Here we go. And uh, ooh, I just noticed this one camera. Is it? Let me just fix this a little bit, give you guys a little bit of a better view here. Yeah, that's. Well, maybe not. I don't know. I should have done this ahead of time. I don't know. It seems like it, it shifted a little bit. Yeah, there we go. I think that's looking better. Gonna try uh, for at least a little while this uh, video. We're gonna go without the music. So uh, I have to say that it's been really uh, very interesting this last week. My phone has been ringing quite a bit when it comes to the world of puzzles. Uh, it's amazing how many people don't read my website and see that I am exclusively a wooden jigsaw puzzle maker. But it's still flattering to get the calls anyway. But uh, I've literally had about a dozen different companies call me looking to order absolutely monster quantities of cardboard jigsaw puzzles which i do not make nor can i make i don't have that kind of a setup uh, but it almost makes me wish i did because <laughs> uh, the smallest quantity of puzzles that someone wanted to order was 500 puzzles of uh, between 500 and 1000 pieces per puzzle and uh, they had their own imagery and then the biggest order request i had was uh, how quickly I could produce 125,000 cardboard jigsaw puzzles. And needless to say, uh, unfortunately, I can't take that order. Uh, but it's uh, nice to see that the people are trying to fill the demand for puzzles because right now jigsaw puzzles are uh, a super hot ticket with everybody being confined to their homes and looking for ways of entertaining themselves with their children or by themselves or elderly parents so jigsaw puzzles are literally as hot a search on the internet as 
uh, breathing respirators and masks, etc. I believe uh, about five or six days ago, I heard through a source that jigsaw puzzles were the number one search for item on Amazon.com. Even if it's the number two or three searched item on Amazon.com, I find that to be incredibly impressive. And I'm glad that uh, people are getting back to jigsaw puzzles. Historically, jigsaw puzzles were super popular back during the 1908-1909 uh, era and then also during the Great Depression. And it was actually quite common to see out-of-work architects, engineers, and seamstresses taking to scroll saws and uh, making puzzles during the week to then uh, take out on a street corner on Friday afternoon, especially in New York City and Boston. And uh, in the posh neighborhoods, they would sell their puzzles to the people that could afford to pay them 3 to $5 for a puzzle. Back in those days, that was enough money to live on for a week or longer. And uh, basically get their groceries and, and uh, pay their bills for the week. And then these people would take the puzzles out to their weekend vacation spots and enjoy them with their families and uh, I don't know if I'm really seeing much of a surge in the world of hand cut wooden puzzle makers although I gotta imagine it's happening uh, but the demand based on the phone calls I have for cardboard puzzles is extremely impressive unfortunately uh, someone who's looking to buy a cardboard puzzle for me for perhaps 15 or 20 dollars to resell it for 30 or 40 dollars uh, when they ask me what the prices are for a 500 piece hand cut puzzle and I tell them that it varies based on what I'm doing with the puzzle but anywhere between 650 and 1100 dollars uh, number one they usually kind of speechless for a moment but then it's, you know obvious that their ideas of how they're going to resell them uh, it's not the price point that they're looking to to do it at. So this is a lovely image by Jane Wooster Scott. She's an artist that I have been working with pretty much since I started making puzzles. I, uh, I ran across Jane in around 19, I want to say it was around 1997 in Westwood, New Jersey at an art gallery just off Main Street there. I can't remember the name of the gallery, but it was somebody's name. Like, I want to say, like, James, I don't know, James Cooley or J James something or Jim something. And uh, so she was present at the gallery because she had a couple of her original paintings being shown. And I walked up to her and introduced myself and uh, told her that I was a wooden puzzle maker. Mind you, at the time, I was pretty much just a beginner. I can't say that my, my puzzles were of the ultimate quality at the time. Uh, and asked her if she would be interested or in talking to me about licensing her work so that I could use it to make puzzles. And she said that she has a business partner who handles all of that. And so she gave me his name and number. And uh, I chatted with her for a few more moments and uh, called up this gentleman the next working day. And I think it was like a Saturday when I saw her in the gallery. And uh, oh no, I can't find where this goes. Hang on one second. It goes here somewhere. There we go. So I called him up and uh, he wanted to know what kind of volume I was going to be doing. And I was like, wow. I was like, I really didn't think about that question. But, you know, hand cut puzzles, we don't do a lot of volume. Even in my busiest, busiest year, which would have been around 2003, 2004, I probably didn't make more than 500 puzzles in the entire year. So I told him, I, I didn't know, but uh, I would say somewhere between one and ten puzzles annually. And uh, I think he was a little surprised by the answer, and he asked me some more questions about, well, what exactly kind of puzzles are you making that you're making so few? And I said, well, they're all handmade. So uh, that was still the early days, early, early days of the Internet. And I managed to get a photograph of a puzzle scanned, and emailed it to him, and he liked it. And he says, sure, we'll work with you. 
He says basically the way we do it is we don't let you reprint the images. You have to buy the hand signed and numbered limited edition art print from us. But then once you own the art print, you can do with anything you want with it. So if you wanted to make a puzzle with it, then go for it. So I was like, wow, all right, that sounds pretty cool. And then I found out that their art prints are pretty expensive. <laughs> but nonetheless, I loved her art a lot. And uh, I wound up buying uh, a couple of prints that I really liked. And sure enough, I started to sell them as puzzles. And one of them was a, a print called Jingle Bells and Carolers. It's a, kind of a Christmassy scene. A wintertime sleigh scene of a small little Americana folk art kind of village. So uh, I put that on my website, which I started back in 1996, and uh, made it the special of the month of November, leading into Christmas for a puzzle season. And I want to say my normal price on the puzzle, it probably, so that puzzle, if I remember correctly, that's about a 550 to 600 piece puzzle. And uh, I, I put the normal price at like $500, but I was selling it as a special for like $375 at the time. <clears throat> and wouldn't you know it that within like two weeks, I got 10 orders for that print cut into a puzzle. And by the way, the print, the retail value of the print was $100. And then as a dealer, I was buying it for $50. So I was also baking that uh, into the cost of the puzzle so I probably was selling the puzzle for uh, probably about $75 more than what I just mentioned taking into consideration the cost of the print so uh, it was really kind of a huge hit and kicked off my very very first real official Christmas season and ever since then I really I don't know I've done a lot of puzzles of Jane's art and this is one of them this one here is called Goblins on a Rampage and as you can see you're seeing part of the print you're seeing in the video down here about I'd say about 40 or 50 percent of the print and uh, this is a really colorful one I've probably cut this over a period of 22 23 years probably cut this into a puzzle about 10 times And today is not one of those days where I need my reading glasses for some reason, so I'm kind of liking that. So that's kind of the story of how I got into Jane Wister Scott's art and her beautiful puzzles. And I have quite a few of her images. I've kind of built up a bit of a collection over the years. And I met a Jane a few more times after that. She would used to come to something known as Galleria down in New York City. It's on one of the piers, very close to where the Nimitz Aircraft Carrier Museum is. And uh, I used to go down to gallery. It's really great if you're in the, uh, if you're in the art world and you need anything from, uh, from laminators to shrink wrap machines to if you're a frame shop and you need to get matting and, and special blades to cut the mats around the pictures that you frame and uh, wood supply for frames, you name it. If it's involving art, there is pretty much everybody on that pier at that kind of like a trade show. And it was really kind of cool. I, I got my, my shrink wrap machine there, and uh, what a great deal I got on that thing. I got one of my early uh, laminate presses there, a heat press. And a few other interesting tools and pieces of equipment. I even got this stuff here. Where is it? I got some right here. Oh, I didn't realize I just pinched this in there like that. Hang on a second. Swapping out the saw, I practically crushed the bottle. So there's this company there that was doing a demonstration. So if you ever buy something from a, a store and they stick this, the price sticker right onto uh, the product, and let's just say it's glass or it's plastic, and you get home and and you want to remove that sticker and you can't get it off and it's all goopy and you're scraping at it and it's just really very inconvenient you put a couple of drops of this stuff on that on that sticker you let it set for about 20 30 seconds and then you just literally take a little corner of a piece of paper towel and you just wipe it right off it just falls off literally so i bought this stuff back then 
and uh, I have had to buy more of it since, of course. This is, I, I have the bottle, the original bottle I, I used or I bought literally 20 years ago sitting around here somewhere. It's all dingy and yellow, but uh, the stuff's not cheap. I don't know, a little bottle like that's about 12 or $15, but it lasts for a few years, and uh, it's fantastic. And uh, I highly recommend that uh, anyone get it. It's called, it's called Undo. Let's see, put that right there. And I don't know if this thing's focusing properly, but, uh, and then here, you can get it on Amazon.com and even on eBay, but there's the, uh, the barcode if you want to write down the number and do a little research or the 800 number there. This stuff's great. It's, uh, I would say it's probably the, one of the most toxic things in my workshop, but again, you're only using a few drops. Uh, I would just say, be careful when you use it and wash your hands afterwards. But it works like a charm. I also have something called Goo Gone. I think most people know more about that. And that works pretty good too. But that kind of has an oily kind of feel to it. And I use it on, on my car, believe it or not, to get the bugs off in the middle of the, uh, middle of the summer. Spray that on the front end along with a little bit of Simple Green. And let it set on a humid night so it doesn't evaporate too quickly. And wow, that does a really nice job. Bugs just come right off the bumper and the headlights. I might have to step away here briefly. My, my dog is outside. I have a, a blue tick coon hound for a dog. She's about four and a half years old. And I just saw her kind of go by on her leash. And I can see that she got her leash wrapped around the stairs to my second story patio out back. So she's going to need rescuing here shortly. And when I start hearing her crying or whining or howling, I'll need to step away for a moment. But so far she seems to be content sitting out in the sun. It's a pretty decent little day today here in Connecticut. A little breezy. We had a, a big rainstorm go through yesterday with tons of severe lightning and multiple inches of rain. I hope the video is turning out pretty good. I went back to using uh, both of my cell phones to shoot this video. And then this one here, we're looking at me and seeing my lips move. That one's hardwired. It's a, it's a nice uh, webcam with uh, high definition 1080p. Video output, so... And I also installed a new Wi-Fi extender, which took a couple weeks to get from Amazon with the delays in the shipping right now with the non-essential kind of items. But uh, it's literally like right above my head in my kitchen. So I'm trying to get a 50 foot, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ethernet cable and uh, drop that down here into my basement. Right now I only have a a 15 foot and a 25 foot and it's not long enough. So what I'm doing right now is just taking this quarter of the puzzle, which is, I don't know, about a foot by a, I don't know, a foot and three inches or so. And in metric, I'd say like 30 centimeters by 40 centimeters. And I'm just breaking it down into some smaller, more manageable sections, about four of them, so that I can carve the detail pieces a little bit easier. I don't spin the large chunks of wood all the way through. Not to mention, this is a, this is a lithograph art print. It's not an image that I printed and laminated. So the paper is a little bit more fibrous. It's, it's a beautiful image and a beautiful art print, but at the same time, not quite as durable as the paper I use in making my puzzles when I print the image. So I want to work with smaller sections for the reason that as you're spinning and handling the puzzle, you're obviously constantly touching the puzzle. I usually try to stick to the surface touching as much as possible. However, um, you know, it's inevitable that I need to touch the edges where those little nubs and 
in a you know, male and female nubs are. And in the process, even though I'm touching it with gentle and professional care, if you start with a large piece of wood and you touch it enough, it's basically kind of like, uh, like you know, repeatedly solving the puzzle, so to speak. It's, it's handling. And eventually, you could get a bit of a lift where the paper splits. Still perfectly adhesed to the wood, and the image is still on the upper surface, but the paper will split in half and kind of lift a little bit. So in order to avoid that almost entirely, I break the puzzle down into small little sections so that in the amount of time it takes me to cut, let's just say, uh, here, I'll hold it up this way, a section about this big, which I would have missed, estimated to be about 50 or so pieces, uh, there, none of the edge is getting handled to such a degree that uh, lifting would really occur. It's pretty rare. All right, so now we're in here and we're gonna carve a, a coffin. Let's back this out a little bit. We're gonna carve a coffin and uh, a graveyard hand kind of like popping up out of the ground there. There, hopefully that's better. Yeah, that looks good. <clears throat> so this is a Halloween scene, and I know they're they're pushing an outhouse on a on a wagon. So I guess they're playing a prank on the person who lives in this house who didn't obviously leave any treats. So they're doing a trick. And relocating the outhouse somewhere else. And then I also love how in the barn the kids are all in their costumes and they're sliding down out of the out of the hay the hayloft door there. And since most of them are wearing these spooky kind of Halloween outfits, I just thought spooky kind of figurals, these shaped pieces that I carve into the puzzle would be highly appropriate. And then when I do this, I am extremely careful to only get the tape. And sometimes just wetting it a little bit with, uh, there we go, it's a common. Ah, maybe not. You know why did I put this tape on a couple weeks ago? It's, even though it's temporary tape, it kind of grabbed on there pretty good. Oh, come on already. Fortunately, I only have a few of these to go. There we go. Coming off. Yeah, it's definitely kind of stuck on there. But it's not sticky at all. It's very smooth, so no no goop left behind. I'll put this over here for now. So I'm curious, how many of you out there in the last three weeks have sat down to work on a jigsaw puzzle? I have to admit that I've only, and I'm noticing there's a little bit of a lag in my cutting video there. Sorry about that. That still has to do with this NDI stuff and the fact that it goes over the Wi-Fi system. And i got to figure out where that goes. I'm still working on expanding my setup here to be all eventually wired in no uh, no wireless video connection I, uh, I have a couple of cameras in my basket on amazon.com unfortunately even if I were to order them today the earliest I would get one of them would be May 1st and the other one is something like May 27th or something like that so uh, Obviously, no tremendous urgent rush at the moment, but little by little, as uh, I can afford to, I will be uh, I'll be expanding the setup to be even more and more professional over time. I had a great conversation with my friend Lon the other day. His uh, he's fully under quarantine at his house and. Those of you that know Lon, Lon is uh, the guy to help me get this all set up, and he has a very, very popular technology YouTube channel. He uh, he does all kinds of reviews of things. And uh, hang on a second. Uh, talking here, I'm kind of always getting twisted around and lost as to where this goes, so bear with me. 
There we go. And uh, so Lana has been under full-blown quarantine for over a month now. He has everything he needs and or wants delivered to his house, including his groceries. And he has been nowhere. So uh, fortunately, he and I, we're both work out of our homes and kind of used to it, even though at this point it's getting to be, you know, kind of crazy. In the past, I think, you know, it was quite common for me to be completely in my house for two or three days at a time without even going out further than just going to get the mail at the mailbox. But, and maybe a week at the most extreme. But this is, uh, this is definitely kind of nuts. But I think he and I are handling it quite well. I'm having way too much fun here. And fortunately, some of the orders are rolling in. I posted a video a few weeks back that I lost, and still lost, all of my corporate-related clients. And it took a huge hit back then. Uh, I had over $13,000 of, of orders that were either already placed, but I hadn't started work on yet. They were under artwork development, etc. Or orders that I was anticipating that pretty much verbally agreed to. And still, you know, they were working on artwork and some logistics about what they wanted to order as far as the design of the puzzle, etc. And then all of a sudden, this all started, and everybody's major events got canceled, and all their meetings got canceled, and so all of those orders just got put on, on basically on hold. One was canceled, and five of them were indefinitely delayed, as pretty much everybody said they all want the they all want to place the order but until they know when they're gonna actually have their meetings and or their trade shows rescheduled uh, they're not gonna be able to order so that was a big hit but fortunately the uh, the private collectors and puzzle enthusiasts have stepped up to the plate and placed some lovely orders for really really nice puzzles through uh, mostly through my online shop at Etsy which you can go to simply by going to markspuzzleshop.com and I've been uploading new images to that shop as well and what I like about what I have in the shop there is these are images that I want to cut I enjoy the images I like the images and for whatever reason uh, some of them are silly like a New York City pretzel or uh, uh, a, a girl, a, a, a girl sitting in a martini glass, kind of a thing. I love that that puzzle. It's so much fun to cut it, and it's kind of cute, and it's it's innocent and yet kind of flirtatious and sexy. Along with many other, I have a couple of mandalas up there. I have some art prints that I don't know, kind of speak to me. They're colorful or historic. And I enjoy cutting them into puzzles, so I've listed them up there. Most of them are uh, more than 75 years old, the images, from artists and from the 1700s, 1800s. I've been to Russia a couple times, and I've been to the Hermitage Museum. And right down the street, about two blocks from the Hermitage Museum, is a museum called the Russian Museum. And it's almost as big as the Hermitage, to tell you the truth. And I have to say, as impressed as I was with the Hermitage in the four full days that I spent inside of that museum, I have to say that uh, the Russian Museum, and I'm lost again, hang on, the Russian Museum is, uh, is absolutely stunning when it comes to the, uh, the painting art that's in there. I've, I've seen a lot of art catalogs and books over the years, being a puzzle maker, looking for prints and or helping customers find a really beautiful piece of art to have made into a puzzle. And in the Hermitage, I probably personally recognized 30 or 40 of the paintings that they had there, whether it be a Monet or a Cezanne or um, any of the other real classic ones, a Renoir. But in the Russian Museum, just two blocks down the road, I recognized well over 100 pieces. And I, they just have some stunning, stunning art there, including Russian artists as well as you know, very famous European artists and even some American artists. 
so uh, I am very partial to cutting those images that I have personally seen in those museums. I've also been to the Prado in Madrid, and I have to say that museum was extremely impressive because uh, I actually got lost in that museum to such a degree that my early cell phone, my one of my early iPhones, I think it was the second iPhone I got, I got it literally the day before I went on that trip. And it had that that map GPS feature. And I was so disorientated inside the Prado that I couldn't figure out how to get to the north side of the building to get back to where I checked in because you have to check your backpack and put it in a locker. And I had a key to my locker. But this building was so monstrous that I couldn't figure out how to get back to where I walked into the place. So I actually used my cell phone's GPS to get myself out of the building. It was pretty funny. All right, where is the rest of this piece? Where did I just put it? Oh, there we go. Oh, why would I stick it over there? And for some reason, this blade is already already feeling like toast. I'm going to crank up the speed a little bit. I don't want to go too fast. This, this DeWalt has an issue. My other one has an issue with sound. This one has an issue with the on-off switch and the speed control. I could turn that dial 30% of the way and it doesn't react. And then I turn it one more percent and all of a sudden it shoots all the way up to where it currently is. And everywhere in between, there's no response. So it's kind of tricky to find the right speed with this thing. But it's running quite smoothly otherwise. Now let's get this figural knocked out over here too before it starts popping up on me like it's already starting to do a bit. So sadly, I don't know if uh, those of you have seen some of my earlier videos, but the, the puzzle parlay that was scheduled to happen this year in July in Sturbridge, Massachusetts has also been... Uh, well, not officially canceled, but it's been delayed by one year. And puzzle parlays are kind of an extra special and very rare event in that they only happen once every two years. And uh, my late friend Paige Elliott, along with my friend Bob Armstrong and a few others, Ann Williams, were some of the original people that started this phenomena called a puzzle parlay by getting together at uh, uh, Rachel Pagey Elliott's uh, sister's house. Her sister's name was Deborah, but I don't remember the last name. And they lived up in, uh, well, Pagey lived in Carlisle, Massachusetts, and Deborah lived in Concord, Massachusetts. Not too far drive right out of town there, headed towards Route 2. And so the first meeting of these puzzle enthusiasts occurred at uh, Deborah's house there. And I, I know what the house looks like. I just don't remember the name of the street. And uh, they started this, uh, this phenomena. So I think the first meeting was in uh, 1995 or 1996. And I got, I started making puzzles in June of 95, but didn't find these puzzle enthusiasts and puzzle friends of mine until about a year and a half later when I started, I put myself on the internet and then one day Ann Williams, who's a noted historian and author of several books about the history of jigsaw puzzles, she found me online and doing some of her research and she sent me a lovely email and she had a brother that lived down somewhere near Philly or Baltimore or DC or something like that. So one of these times, and she lives up in Maine, one of the times that she uh, was gonna go see her brother she asked if she could stop by and meet me. So I said, sure. And I lived in uh, a place in very southern New Jersey at the time called Upper Deerfield, which is not far from Elmer. And the mail, uh, the mail post office is actually in Elmer, New Jersey. And this is about a 35, 40 minute drive exactly east from the Delaware Memorial Bridge. So, uh, so Ann did come down and pay me a visit and was polite enough to look at my shop. And my God, my shop was absolutely nothing at the time. It was about 10 feet by 10 feet. I had a Sears Craftsman scroll saw and uh, I hadn't even found the good puzzle wood yet. <laughs> I was cutting calendar prints and stuff like that. And uh, I wasn't technically really very much in business yet. Uh, and once again, I got lost. There we go. 
so uh, it was a nice visit. I remember she signed a, she asked me if she could sign a guest book, and I didn't even have one. So I had this log book laying around, and I opened it up to the page, and she signed off on that. And so that was sweet. I still have that to this day, along with many other visitors over the years. So uh, Anne went on her way, but she, uh, she kind of like put me in touch with the world of puzzlers in that she knows Bob Armstrong, and uh, Bob Armstrong is this amazing guy that uh, is a retired attorney. He lives in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, and he is a big-time collector of hand-cut wooden puzzles, and I got, to, I got to know Bob very well over those years. And he and I sometimes even worked out deals because I used to get a lot of leads on people cleaning out their parents or their grandparents' attic and coming across a stash of old wooden puzzles. And they'd give me a call because I was very easily findable in those early days on the Internet. And I, I would be interested in their collections, but sometimes their collections were more than I could afford to buy or want to buy. And so Bob and I would step in together and we would share the collections and he'd fund the rest of whatever it is I couldn't afford to get. And sometimes he'd even get leads and he'd call me up and say, Hey, are you interested? And we would uh, sit in his living room after the puzzles would arrive. And we would literally do sort of like uh, the NFL draft or something like that, where we basically just take turns and pick a puzzle. And we would pre-estimate the value of the puzzle that based on what we paid for the collection. And so when we pick a puzzle we obviously like the puzzle but we know that we're spending whatever x dollars is that we wrote on the puzzle onto the puzzle and at the end we just take turns all the way through so if there's 20 puzzles you know i i pick one he picks one and then i pick one and he picks one and then at the end if one of us got a puzzle that the other one really really wanted we might you know haggle a little bit about that and swap out one or two and then that was how we acquired some, some nice stuff in our collection So anyway, this is uh, this is how Ann Williams uh, kind of introduced me to it. And then back in those days, I hadn't met Bob yet. But Bob was having a... Uh, I guess, what's the right word for it? So he took part of his collection and he, uh, he brought it to the Worcester Public Library, which is a large library in downtown Worcester, Massachusetts, which is really a small city. And uh, he invited everybody on a particular Saturday to kind of come up and have a parlay, which was a follow-up on the original one that, that Paigey and her sister created over in Concord. And so it was my first time, other than meeting Ann, that quick visit to my home in southern New Jersey, it was really my first time meeting other puzzlers and also ever seeing another hand-cut wooden puzzle. The internet was so new that there was nobody on the internet making puzzles. As a matter of fact, when I first created my website, and I did some searches on InfoSeek and AltaVista and Lycos, if you guys remember those domain names and search engines before the days of Google. And, uh, well, Yahoo was around pretty early, too. But, um, hang on a second here. Yeah, so I'd never seen another hand-cut puzzle before. And it was really quite impressive. I was, I was amazed at... Uh, the skill set of some of these historic cutters like Parker Brother Pastimes and Par Puzzles and Unit Puzzles and Falls Puzzles. And there were a couple of uh, modern hand cutters there too. Uh, Bob's uh, youngest son, Conrad, is a, a phenomenal cutter. And although he does, he's never done it, quote unquote, professionally for a living, he, he always had a real day job. But he did do some puzzles on the side, but he's a very skilled cutter. And uh, John Stokes uh, from San Diego wasn't at that particular meeting. John showed up a couple of years later. But John was a, an absolute phenomenal cutter. Uh, John had some, I don't know how his brain was wired, but let me tell you, it, it's very, very, very creative stuff that he's capable of doing. And another friend of mine, David Beffin Negrini out of New Hampshire, he, he has a site called Fool's Gold Puzzles. And David's a very talented cutter. He also had a day job, so puzzles for him were more of a passion. Although he did make some money at it, I'm sure. Because you can't cut as well as he can cut. And 
not 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 make a decent penny at at your craft. Trying to think who else was already a cutter back in that early, early point of the modern day cutters. I think there's a, that's just about all that comes to mind at the moment. Melinda Chabelle with uh, Jardin Puzzles, the French word for garden, J A R D I N puzzles.com. Uh, she showed up around, uh, I'm going to say around 2001 or so. And she's a phenomenal cutter as well. She only cuts part time, though, another person with a real job that has a passion and a real skill for it and uh oh what's his name why am i drawing a blank I'm, I'm lousy with names i'm really good with numbers though jeff 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 something he has bogart's puzzles and i can't remember his last name off the top of my head which is crazy because i know him rather well he's an architect also not too far from uh concord massachusetts and uh, so he makes a pretty awesome puzzle. And I met, I met, or no, Jay, Jay, Jeff or Jay. Gosh, I'm going crazy here. <laughs> I hate when I can't recall stuff easily. But uh, so anyway, that's uh, the early days of puzzles and getting together. And so looking at Bob's collection was really impressive. And I remember Ann Williams coming up to me at one point and she showed me two puzzles. And she asked me if I could identify who the cutters were. And I was like, what? Like, I thought it was like one of the craziest questions. I didn't ever think of it that way. But, uh, so my answer was obviously no, I have no idea. And so she, she basically showed me the two puzzles and then explained to me who the cutters were. And then as I got to know puzzles more, I understood that puzzles are basically like handwriting. Every scroller that makes puzzles cuts in a different way there's no two truly identical cutters there's some cut styles that can kind of look similar but for the most part if you were to analyze it closely uh, there is a major difference and so I learned very easily how to identify a a par puzzle versus a pastime puzzle versus a falls puzzle versus a unit puzzle although units and Pastime puzzles do have a, a rather similar appearance to them, so they are they can be a little tricky. Yeah, nice to see that my camera is actually, even though I'm putting my piece there, it's staying pretty well focused. So. I'm, I'll leave it at that, but I might zoom in here a little bit so you guys can see some more detail. Hopefully you're enjoying what I'm rambling about. And I hope this microphone's doing a good job. It's this new microphone that I I received in the mail about, uh, I don't know, 10 or 14 days ago. Oh, it's so nice to have this saw be quiet, huh? You saw some of my early videos. Ugh, the thing was pinging and panging like crazy. Silly me for not, uh, not trying to swap it out sooner. So the puzzle parlay that's going to be the next one will be in July of 2021 now. And uh, I believe it's puzzleparlay.org as the website. And if I'm wrong, then you go to Bob Armstrong's website, which is oldpuzzles.com. He will definitely have a link to that on his homepage since he's one of the three or four people that are involved with uh, organizing uh, all of the parlays ever since I've been doing this for 25 years now. Well, 25 years this coming June in two months. So 
So what else can we talk about here? Let me think. I wish this was alive. You guys can chime in and hit me up with a question or two. Kind of send me on a direction here. Once again, if this is the first time you're seeing one of my videos, I'd just like to tell you that the wood that I'm using is one quarter inch thick, which is also seven millimeters for you metric folks. Uh, seven millimeters thick. It's a birch wood that I get from Finland. It's a five ply. It's a wonderful wood. I like it much, much better than, than Baltic birch, which I find to be a much, even though they're both birch, I don't understand how two different, two birch woods can be so different or regions that they're grown in, but uh, Baltic birch strikes me as really, really hard wood to cut. And I don't know, it just feels like the blade is really working to get through the wood really hard. And uh, it also uh, has inner layers that often have these little spots where there's either rotten wood or a gap between when they start and finish um, or finish and start a new layer uh, when they when they spin the logs on the gigantic razor blade thing to peel off those thin layers like a like a pencil sharpener and uh, they leave these gaps and sometimes there's little spots where there was a knot and so there's sometimes no no wood there at all and so when you're cutting these little tiny tiny little pieces you'll hit a spot where the the upper part and the lower part of the wood just literally has no connection because one of the middle layers is either rotten or outright missing or you'll have a little gap maybe a quarter inch gap and uh, if those aren't so terrible you can squeeze a little glue in there when you when you discover them and let that set overnight and then you can go back to cutting the next day but it's you know it's not a not a convenient thing to have happen if you're in the production of of quality wooden jigsaw puzzles time consuming to deal with and not a pleasant for you nor your customer to deal with uh, you know a puzzle piece that might have a, a bit of a defect in it fortunately with this Finland birch it's extremely rare for me to run across that and when I do run across it it's usually a very small problem that's fixed pretty quickly and easily I'd say I literally run across a void about once every year and a half or two years. It's, uh, it's a pretty rare event with the Finland birch. So that's what I'm cutting. And the blades that I'm using are uh, kind of like they, they refer to them as uh, jigsaw puzzle blades. And they're seven thousandths of an inch thick with about a twelve thousandths of an inch kerf. Kerf is like the depth of the blade versus the width of the blade. And uh, there's about 33 teeth per inch. And the blades are about 5 to 6 inches long. here on my scroll saw it's not your typical scroll saw I'm not a big fan of uh, cutting on a metal surface and when you buy a scroll saw they typically uh, you know they're very metallic yeah, I just realized my other camera here it uh, seems to have adjusted for some reason so, uh, sorry about that folks let's just try to fix that there we go uh, all right let's get another piece of this puzzle out kind of a nice day outside today but unfortunately it's just a tad bit too breezy and a tad bit too too chilly to set up my saw on my deck and do some outdoor cutting like I was doing a few days ago I didn't make a video for YouTube a few days ago but I made a couple uh, live uh, videos on my Facebook so if you uh, if you want to see some of the, my live broadcasts for the time being, I do them almost exclusively on Facebook. 
and uh, occasionally on uh, Twitch. But um, just like or follow or friend me on Facebook. It's MGC Custom Wooden Puzzles is my name on Facebook. And just do a search for that. And when you find me, uh, I, know I, I try to do a live video once or twice a week on there. So I have a couple up there and you can view them if you, uh, you go and look at my wall. Along with a little bit of uh, self-promoting. It is a definite interesting time in that puzzles are super popular right now. There's people really uh, looking for ways to entertain themselves under this quarantine kind of scenario that almost all of us find ourselves uh, dealing with. I'm getting rid of this blade. That's shot. I'm not liking the feel of it. And it's a very tactile kind of profession to be in. You get a kind of a real fine touch for things. You can feel the tiniest bumps on the surface of a, a puzzle image. If there's an issue with the mount, or even before you mount it, you just run your hand over it before you, uh, you fix it permanently. And you can just feel that there's a bump or possibly some sawdust or some tiny piece of debris got underneath the, uh, the image when you're sticking it to the wood. You can get it out of there before it, that's weird. That sounded weird. You can get it out of there before it permanently gets stuck into the puzzle. But at the same time, when you put a blade on and you run it through the wood, you can almost instantly feel whether or not it's a good blade. And once in a while you get a blade, it's like, ugh, terrible. And those blades, I have this little wooden hammer that I made many years ago and I, uh, I hate the blade so much that I literally grab my hammer after I cut that one puzzle piece and I slam it into the br blade and I break to destroy the blade and toss it in my toss it in my garbage. Fun little ways of entertaining yourself when you work from home. <laughs> better at doing this. Sometimes talking is very distracting and I lose track of where I am on the puzzle. Wow, oh, there is a big delay, so I apologize for that, but uh, at least uh, it appears that you're able to see what I'm doing pretty well, so despite the fact that my voice is rather far ahead of yeah, let's say about two or three second delay there. I would have thought that closer Wi-Fi would have had a bigger impact on speeding this up. I'll need to look into that. Today is the first day I'm using that that Wi-Fi range extender thing. I think it really would work best once I get a longer cable and I can relocate it all the way down here into the basement where I have my shop and I can have nothing between the source of the Wi-Fi and my phones and my laptop here. I also uh, ordered a, an 8-way gigabit switch splitter for 1 gigabit speed. Although now I'm seeing that uh, there's 2.5 gigabits and 10 gigabit switches. But the speed of this video is only transmitting at, I think, a maximum of about uh, 400 megabits, so I don't need anything faster than one gigabit switch. I did want to do that I obviously can't do anymore as I wanted to cut little Frankenstein there into his own figural and I forgot to do it oh well can't go and do that now so here we go Frankie
So we're at 55 minutes on this video. Whew. Hopefully you guys aren't getting too bored with my, my commentary. And I hope to be able to read some interesting things down below in the coming days and weeks. Comments. I'm after I shoot this video, I'm going to actually, uh, for scrollers out there, I'm going to be doing a, uh, a short little video about how to make your own template for those of you that need to uh, trace cut your puzzles. I'm going to draw up a nice little template in a short video. Can't imagine it's going to take more than 10 minutes to make that video. But give you guys something fun to, uh, to do and entertain your your family members with with a nice homemade puzzle. And also if you're a first timer on this video, I was just telling you about my, my wood thickness and my blades, but also feel free to uh, look down below the video and click on the subscribe button and then also on the bell so you can be notified when I do put out new material. I haven't been super productive in making videos in the last couple of weeks, but uh, there's moments where I go through certain spurts of making videos, and I know I'm kind of feeling like that in the next couple of weeks, I'll be putting out quite a bit more content here. And if you want to see some of my some of my work and possibly even buy one of my puzzles or more than one you can go to markspuzzleshop.com that will funnel you right into my Etsy store and in my Etsy store I have about 70 puzzle images listed and you can order them in a variety of sizes now in almost all the cases except for the Jane Worcester Scott print ones I actually use the real art print to make those puzzles so the size is very fixed and I usually offer just one or maybe two piece count options for those puzzles using a real art print not a reprint so you can uh, select one of those or you can use one of the images where I print the puzzle and I've even started to in some cases some people have inquired as to whether or not they could just buy a print of some of my images so I've added started to add a, a print option only uh, for people to uh, to do that and where did I go? I lost myself here. Oh, there we go. So if you see an image, and actually one of the crazy ones that I've gotten three orders for as prints, as well as, and then a few others as puzzles, but I have a, a bottle of Jameson whiskey up there. And uh, not sure why that's so popular, but I've sold, uh, I've sold three prints of that in the last couple of weeks. Just print it off, roll it up, stick it in the tube, and send it on its merry way. And hopefully they enjoy the framing of it. The one nice thing about my prints, unlike maybe a typical poster that's mechanically printed with some standard ink, is that all of my printing is done with super archival inks that last for 200 to 400 years under ambient room light. Somebody called me there and surprised. It didn't mess with my, oh wow, it didn't mess with my broadcast. So that was my business line, but I didn't get it in time. If I'd answered the phone call, though, I'm pretty sure that would have dropped the signal. Yeah, I'll have to give them a call back after I'm done with this video. So yeah, anyway, it was pretty interesting that I got a couple of little print orders. I don't make a whole lot on them, but it's nice to know that... Uh, People enjoy the image so much and they want to have the print possibly hang it in their their home bar or their their office or I don't know something like that I don't know where people would hang a Jameson bottle image but college dorm room <laughs> which right now nobody's in college because they're all closed So yeah, stop into my shop. I hope uh, you'll see something you like. If you're a scroller, I, I strongly encourage you to get even a, just a little puzzle. 
I do have some in there that are in the $85 to $150 range on the small side. And uh, get your hands on one of them. Number one, they're a lot of fun. It's not the kind of thing that you're going to put together once and throw it away in the back of a closet somewhere. I'm sure you're going to like it so much that you're going to break it out and work on it multiple times each year. And if you have friends visiting, uh, family members or personal guests, uh, you'll definitely want to break it out and challenge them to, uh, to beat your time in putting it together. The smaller ones typically can be done in one sitting, anywhere from, from 30 minutes to a couple of hours, depending on what image it is and how difficult I cut it. But it's also a great way to compare what it is that I'm doing as a professional puzzle maker that's been making puzzles for 25 years in, uh, compares, in comparing to your own cutting and scrolling and kind of gives you a little, little bit of a, a real-world comparison kind of guide to what to work up to. And I would say now don't buy just my puzzles either. Just You can get a couple of us cutters. Uh, my friend David at foolsgoldpuzzles.com and Melinda at jardinpuzzles.com and uh, Dave, uh, Jeff or Jay. I can't, Jay, why, why can't I get his name straight? But he's got uh, a site called bogartpuzzles.com. And Bogart is the name of his dog, so his uh, his logo on on his puzzles, his signature piece is a uh, Portuguese water dog, which is what kind of dog he has. It's driving me crazy that I can't remember his last name. Oh, I got it now. It just came to mind. So it's Jay Hollis, I believe. And if I'm wrong, sorry, Jay. I just, I'm drawing a blank. I don't know why. I just have a, a hiccup with names sometimes. Almost makes me wish I had my other laptop down here right now so that I could quickly Google it. <laughs> and when I go let my dog in briefly and step away for about 90 seconds, I will probably grab my laptop and bring it down here just so I can do that. But I'm pretty confident it's Jay Hollis. I'm carving out this lovely little witch's pot a brew here to boil her bats and her her rats and her crow feathers and whatever else she puts in there and toads second while I clean up this this tape since it's been on here for a little while and a little extra difficult to get it off. Now this one was easier than the last one. There we go. And I decided not to put any music in today's video. I started using this uh, royalty-free music playlists on Spotify and even on YouTube. And then when I go make my videos using the songs on these supposedly royalty-free music lists, I get a message from uh, YouTube almost immediately after uploading my videos saying that I have a copyright a violation and that my video cannot be monetized in the future. But uh, they still let me display the video, of course. But I could never earn any, any advertising funds from it at any future point in time if I ever get to the point where I monetize my, my YouTube channel. Right now, I don't make any money from it. I don't have enough subscribers or enough hours of viewing to, uh, to qualify for that. I need to have 1,000 subscribers as well as 4,000 viewing hours over the last 
365 days before you can apply to be a, a monetized account. But I do like making the videos, especially now that I got the sound figured out. That was very frustrating in a lot of my earlier videos. As a matter of fact, I, I removed a number of them from my channel because the sound was extremely bad in my opinion. And I turned the videos into private videos for the time being so that I can remember to reshoot a video that's somewhat similar to kind of replace it with. And then once I do do that, I will, I will delete it from the memory banks of the YouTube world. So weird, this particular blade has a strange sound to it. I don't know if any of you are hearing that. And uh, let me just see here, interlock, no interlock. All right, so I need to, and then my eyes are starting to go just a little bit and I'm looking around. Do I have a, yes I do. Glasses, get some sawdust off of them. Put these on because oh, my eyes just seem to be going a little bit off right now. What I like doing with these Jane Worcester Scott lithograph and serigraph prints that I cut into puzzles is they have this, I, can't, I maintain part of the, the white border of the, of the image on the, on the art paper because uh, the, the pieces are all signed and numbered. So if you notice, like right here, there's, uh, there's the number of this particular print, number four, uh, 642 out of 795 and then over here on this chunk that I still have not trimmed off you'll see that uh, that Jane has uh, signed her name so it's a signed and numbered limited edition print and I carve these little white bottom strips uh, kind of in their own little puzzles so to speak and I only put a random interlock to hold it onto the image in the early days of doing this I used to cut those strips into almost identical looking puzzle pieces that were a little bit bigger, almost an inch by an inch. And I figured if uh, the family that was buying the puzzle had a young child, they could assign those pieces to the child to put together because there were typically only between, I'd say like 16 to 25 of those pieces. And they're still tricky to put together because they really kind of looked rather similar, but it kind of felt like giving the, the, the younger child the opportunity to get involved with a puzzle that maybe was a little bit too challenging for them otherwise so that's sort of what that is and then I don't know lately I kind of decided to get away from that young child concept and just simply still carve them off like I do in that they're their own sort of separate entity of the puzzle but now I decided to cut them a little bit more tricky so that there is actually a challenge to solving them and some cases, uh, I don't want to really kind of verbally talk about what I do. You'll have to buy one and, and find it out or pay really close attention to what I'm doing as I'm cutting it. But uh, I like messing with people sometimes and making them scratch their head and wonder what the heck is going on here. <laughs> it's kind of a cool job. You get to uh, get paid a decent wage to... Uh, mess with people's minds. And if you didn't, they'd actually be mad at you. So think about that for a second. Cool job, huh? Uh, 
Although there are times that uh, some people can't handle it. I did have this one gentleman call me up once, and this is going back a lot of years. I want to say this is probably probably the first or second year that I lived in Connecticut before I, I did the addition on the old house and built myself a nice office. I used a downstairs bedroom as my, my kind of computer room, my office, and I just remember that I was still in that office when this guy called me, so that was definitely in... I want to say late 99 or 2000 and he was pretty much bragging to me at how amazing of a puzzle solver he is and that he can put together a thousand five hundred piece puzzle in just a few hours and and just kind of going on and on blowing his own whistle so to speak tooting his own horn and I was like all right you know cool if you're a good puzzler that's fantastic so uh, he wanted to order a particular puzzle from me and uh, he wanted me to make the puzzle, and I quote unquote, as challenging as humanly possible to give him his money's worth since it's the first time he's ever ordered a hand cut wooden puzzle. Now, mind you, as challenging as possible, you're asking a professional puzzle maker, even though I was still in my early in my career, to basically throw everything at you, including the kitchen sink, to stump you from solving the puzzle. So I'm like, I'm loving this request. This is like a dream come true. Wow, cool. I get to throw everything into this puzzle. And uh, he paid me about, I'm going to say about $1,100 for this puzzle. That was about 700 pieces. And I made this puzzle really, really tricky. And sent it off to him. And about two weeks after I sent it to him, he called me up. And he was literally enraged. And he was so enraged that he was actually quite foul with his language. He was dropping the F-bomb and a few other choice words and really kind of chewing me out, basically claiming that I didn't send him all of the pieces to the puzzle. And I said, sir, I personally cut the puzzle and I personally packaged this puzzle. And I can assure you that when it left my facility, it was complete and in perfect condition. And he's like, it's impossible. He says, I can't solve the edge. And I'm like, sir, I said, you very specifically told me to make the puzzle as challenging as possible. So why in the world would I let you solve the edge first? And he paused. And I remember this very crazy kind of pause. And he's like, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, sir, you're not going to put the edge together. That's what you do with a cardboard puzzle, with a hand cut wooden puzzle. I cut it so that you have to figure out what internal pieces to use to lock those edge pieces together, but they themselves do not interconnect with each other. And he's like, what the heck is that all about? <laughs> and he said, fine. And he like kind of slams the phone and hangs up on me. I hear from him literally about a month later, and he told me he finally solved the puzzle. So here's a 700-piece puzzle that this guy bragged about putting together 1,500-piece puzzles together in a few hours and here he is taking now a total of approximately six weeks to solve my 700 piece puzzle <laughs> and tells me that uh, he's glad that he finally solved it and he wanted to let me know that all the pieces were in fact in the puzzle box but that it was the most challenging puzzle that he has ever done in his life and he will most definitely not ever be ordering another puzzle from me. And I was offended by that last statement because I did exactly as I was told. And I said, I right away said to him, I said, sir, you asked me to make it as hard as possible. I can make you another puzzle and I can make it so that it's not that challenging if you would prefer something a little bit easier. But then I think in return, that kind of insulted him a little bit. And he wasn't, quote unquote, the amazing puzzler that he thought he was. So... Sadly, I never heard from him again after that phone call hung up. But uh, it was a, it makes for a really interesting story. <laughs> and it's not the first time I got a phone call where somebody thought they didn't have all the pieces with that whole edge thing. But that was the only time that that phone call was an irate phone call.
And I'm just kind of realizing I'm sharing a lot of fun little stories with you guys. So anyone who's hanging out this long into the video, I hope you're, uh, you're enjoying the stories. And again, feel free to leave your comments below, even if you've already left a comment below since watching the beginning of this video. Feel free to make multiple comments if you like. And I uh, wouldn't be too surprised if in future videos I don't repeat the stories. Only because uh, not everybody's going to watch every video. And I don't want to have the, a story like that only in a single video. And potentially people missing out on it. Because I think that last one's kind of a really funny one. I like telling it. coming along nice I'm gonna get this this puzzle counted down and packaged up and on Monday if I head to the post office I will mail this off to my customer he'll be very happy to receive it I'm actually a little surprised I haven't heard from him in the last week and a half asking me where this is One thing I have found with the current situation is that I'm definitely not shipping stuff on a daily basis. I limit my trips to the post office to between one and two trips a week. So I accumulate a few orders and then take anywhere from two to five of them and drop them off. Usually on Mondays and then possibly a Thursday or Friday. I'm gonna try to think of a title for this video and I'm probably gonna just say Mark rambles on or something like that because it's been nothing but me rambling I'm going to try to adjust this video camera that's looking down on my saw. I'm noticing, I don't know if it's been moving ever so microscopically over the duration of this video. So pardon the, uh, the adjustment here, folks, but I just wanted to change the viewpoint just a touch. Hopefully that is a little bit better. All right, and it doesn't obstruct with my view, which it almost does, but... Interesting how that's not refocusing on my hands. And I don't recall that being a setting that I set, but interesting. So that's a kind of a perfect example, as you saw earlier. This was a... Uh, this down here is an edge. So if you see how it kind of connects right there? Yeah, well, a little bit of a delay there, but oh well. It actually gives you a chance to go look for what it is I'm talking about, so not a terrible thing. If you aren't already a subscriber, I'm still trying to reach that 
1,000 subscriber mark. So even if you are a subscriber, if you know anybody that enjoys scrolling or really could use a nice entertaining puzzle video, and if you think that that's what this video is, feel free to uh, send them a link and ask them to subscribe to my channel. As soon as I get to that 1,000 subscriber mark, I will be able to do live videos, and you guys can chime in, and I'd love to be able to interact with even just a handful of viewers on a live video. It would be really quite wonderful for everybody, I think. Especially me with the isolation of being cooped up in my house for a month now, other than a couple of very brief grocery trips. It would be very interactive and uh, enjoyable. So what other little stories can I tell you about? Think, think, think. And right now I'm drawing a bit of a blank. Not a lot of this puzzle to go. We're at the one hour, 22 minute mark. Curious to see how many views this video gets being a really long video. I'm, I've heard people say, oh, don't make long videos. People aren't gonna wanna click on them and watch them. And I do believe there's probably some truth to that for sure for some people. But if you really wanna watch me make a puzzle, and the video has to be long because hand cut wooden puzzles are not made quickly. It's a, it's a labor of love. It's a lot of patience required. And uh, it's not that easy. It requires a certain level of, uh, of skill and uh, definitely a lot of patience. When I first got into puzzles, I have a friend that lives in Florida and uh, I kind of convinced him to try to start making puzzles. And uh, even, and he also had a younger brother, so the two of them really started making puzzles briefly, or, well, I do mean briefly. The younger brother, I think, <laughs> tried to make one puzzle. It was about an eight inch by 10 inch image. And uh, he asked me, well, how many puzzles pieces do you typically cut an eight by 10 into? And I told him, well, roughly about 150 pieces. And so he started doing it, and he got, <laughs> I think he got about 30 pieces into it, and it was probably about a half an hour of work to get those 30 pieces when you're, because when you're a beginner, you're definitely slower. And he called me up on the phone, and he's like, are you crazy? I don't have the patience for this. He says, I'm not doing this. <laughs> I don't think he ever finished cutting that puzzle. So, and then his older brother down in Florida succeeded in, uh, in making some puzzles. And, uh... And actually, he was really good at it, I thought, uh, for only making a handful of puzzles. He definitely had a skill for it. And unfortunately, he uh, he had a situation that I think it's, it's an unfortunate situation, but he got invited through a mutual friend of his to bring some of his uh, puzzles to this woman's home down in Florida. She was, from what I remember and understand, she was rather wealthy. And she was interested in, in his work. She heard about him locally by word of mouth. So he showed up at her home with, uh, I believe it was three puzzles. And she loved them. And she wanted to know how much he wanted for them. And I don't, I don't know what his price was. But I believe he was in the vicinity of about 50 cents a puzzle piece. 
So I think his price tag was probably in the vicinity of about $70 per puzzle. And this rich, and I'll use the word right now because in my opinion, you don't invite an artist into your home and make such a comment. So I'll say it quite bluntly. This rich bitch basically scoffed at his request of $70 a puzzle. And she goes, there's no way I'm paying that for a jigsaw puzzle. And, of course, that's insulting and it's hurtful. And my friend uh, left her house and threw those puzzles in the garbage and quit the business. And that's very unfortunate to have happened that way. I think he should have realized that she was a bitch. And uh, taking his business to somebody who has an appreciation for someone who puts their heart and soul into making something and is willing to pay a, a fair trade price for the skill and time and patience that goes involved into making a, a beautiful handmade one-of-a-kind puzzle. a nice little pumpkin there it's interesting how wetting the wetting the paper ever so slightly there on the top makes it definitely separate from the print much easier So yes, you scrollers out there that are watching my video, you definitely need to take into consideration that you need to have a lot of patience to make these puzzles. You're not going to make a 500 piece puzzle in 30 minutes or even an hour. As a beginner cutter to make a really good 500 piece puzzle, I'd say it would probably take about 10 hours to cut it, not including the preparation and the finishing and boxing and all that kind of thing. Not to mention, if you're going to personalize the puzzle, the time it takes to stencil the figurals and come up with them and the placement of them. And if people want very special ones, you have to research them and look them up, come up with the design. That's kind of why when I make puzzles, I, I include one or two per 100 pieces of puzzle as my kind of standard. But if people want more than that, well, then they're going to pay me extra for that because... I can cut probably 10 puzzle pieces, and in some cases even more than that, in the time it takes me to cut and uh, plan out one figure piece. So I charge an additional $10 for each personalized figure piece that, that people desire for me to cut into the puzzles. So if you order a 1,000 piece puzzle, you'll get 20 of them automatically. And the way I work words is if they want a word, let's say someone's name carved into the puzzle, every three letters or any that part thereof is equal to one figural. So if somebody's got a seven letter name, that counts as three figurals in my book. And I'm char I charge them accordingly. So they chew up those first 20 complimentary figurals that are included in the, the price that I list on my website. But then as they pass over that, then I'll tack on $10 per figural. I recently actually had a woman about, uh, I want to say about four months ago, she ordered um, a 1,050-piece puzzle, which comes with 21 figurals. And she ordered 48 figurals. <laughs> so uh, I had to tack on, I believe, 
I'm not mistaken, another 270 or 280 dollars or something like that, because that was a lot of work to lay out all those extra, all those extra pieces. It turned out to be one hell of a puzzle, though, worth every penny, in my opinion. And I'm not saying that from a salesman point of view. I'm saying that from looking at the finished puzzle, it was really quite fabulous. some respects, I even think that $10 isn't enough based on what sometimes goes into coming up with the appropriate figure, especially if it's a, a unique request. And you have to figure out, well, where, where am I going to get that image from? And, uh, or silhouette. And you spend 10 or 15 minutes looking it up and tracing it out and applying it. And heck, in 15 minutes, I can cut 20 pieces. <laughs> Excuse me. I didn't bring down any water with me, darn it. My saw doesn't really generate much sawdust, but yeah, sometimes I get a little bit of a little bit of a sawdust cough down here. Dry throat. Plus all this talking. So hopefully the uh, camera isn't staring at the top of my hat the whole time. I swear I heard something upstairs and I'm home alone, so that's kind of strange. So... Alright, so that's the bottom of that little chunk right there. Come on, get in there. There we go. So I'd love to get a little feedback on uh, what you guys think of the new microphone. I'm hoping you like it as much as I do. Especially if you've heard some of my earlier videos from, let's say, six or eight weeks ago. And uh, other than the delay factor, which I'm well aware of on my, my other two uh, cameras here, which are my cell phones that are connected to my laptop OBS system with an NDI wireless feature. Uh, it's interesting, the saw, the saw camera is really kind of like almost virtually no delay at all. But then this one over here has, look at that. Wow, a huge delay over there. That's like four or five seconds. I don't get it. But I'm glad the saw camera is dead on accurate. I want to say less than a tenth of a second delay. Let's go in and make part of this scarecrow a figure. That'd be kind of fun. I'm gonna leave his legs not part of the figure because it would just make it too large. So we're gonna take his whole coat, head, and arms, and we're gonna do that. So here we go. And then I'm going to, all this straw sticking out of the end here, I'm actually going to do a little interlock, almost like a little hand or something.
And then we'll do another little interlock over here too. All right, there we go. And we have our little scarecrow guy. And that camera's drifting again. Let me just do a little quick adjustment for you. Sorry, a little bit deep in the thought there. There was a bit of a tricky spot, so kind of thinking my way through it before I cut it. Often I don't really need to think much about my cutting. It just kind of comes natural, but there's those moments when a little extra attention to detail is important. If any of you have not seen my Instagram account and you'd like to see some photography going back to about three years ago of all the puzzles, or close to all the puzzles I've made, you should visit my uh, my Instagram account. You can go to that at, uh, if you just go to Instagram and log into your app and then search for my initials, which is MGC, Mike George Charlie, uh, MGC underscore custom underscore puzzles you'll find my account and uh, you can have a little fun browsing in there and seeing all kinds of cool stuff I do a little photography on the side as kind of a, a hobby although I, I have made money at it in the past it, it's really an insig insignificant thing but I'm pretty good at it I enjoy it so I hope you enjoy the photography you see in there So interesting how this cell phone that's my camera for my cutting is literally dead on perfect timing. And yet that other one over there where the puzzle is being assembled is so ridiculously delayed. <laughs> it's kind of mind-boggling actually. Yep, almost done with the pumpkin patch. Where's Charlie Brown? Yeah, 
And one of the images I really want to cut by Jane Worcester Scott that I have yet to get an order for, ever, is uh, an image called The Life of Riley. And it's a beautiful image. It's a big one, though, and that's probably why I haven't gotten an order for it. Uh, it's 20 inches tall and 40 inches wide. But I would love to cut that, so anybody out there that... Uh, is interested in buying a beautiful puzzle, I'll, I'll even probably throw in some extra personalization complimentary only because I'm dying to cut that image into a puzzle, but it's not the kind of thing I invest the time and effort into on the speculation of selling it someday. So I'm just waiting for the day that that, that image gets ordered. And it's in my Etsy store. So if you go to markspuzzleshop.com and you look for the Jane Worcester Scott lithograph called The Life of Riley. You'll be able to see the one I'm talking about. There's a lot of good images by, of hers that I really enjoy cutting, but for some reason this one in particular is definitely one I'm interested in cutting. It would make a serious asset to any puzzle enthusiast's collection, that's for sure. Well, my dog is barking away at something outside. More than likely, someone walking down the road with a dog of their own. <laughs> kind of surprised that she's been wanting to be out there this entire time. I think I'm going to end this video after just cutting this little chunk right here. You guys don't need to see me cut the rest of the white area. Not the most exciting thing to look at. And I uh, appreciate anyone who's hung in to watch the video to this point. should almost uh, give you a special 5% discount code on an Etsy puzzle or something like that. <laughs> For being a hardcore trooper. This video is uh, 1 hour 42 minutes long, and it's by far the longest video I've made to date. Wow, look at that. <laughs> that delay over there to the table is, is just huge. If there's going to be delay on any camera, that's the camera to be delayed. I don't think it's all that important that that one be perfectly timed. I have another webcam that I could put over there. And I actually have it over there. I can even set it up real quick, but I don't like the way it looks. So uh, the only webcam that's halfway decent is this one that's looking at me. And so that's why I use that one. See, so the time right now is almost 3 p.m. on the day. So I'm going to send this video on up to YouTube. But I have a feeling that since it's so long, it won't even be viewable till about dinner time. Uploading YouTube videos is definitely, uh, it's not a fast process. And I used to do some off my phone and it's upload a 40-minute a video directly off of my phone used to take about anywhere from 6 to 10 hours, which is kind of crazy. 
but uh, uploading it off the laptop, not so bad. I imagine a video like this is going to take about three hours to upload. Maybe a little bit longer, but not terribly longer than that. And the timing of this is really good, too, because I didn't eat lunch, and I'm really kind of hungry right now. Just saute up some portobello mushrooms and some some bell peppers, a little bit of onion, salt and pepper, a little bit of olive oil, maybe a, a little cut of butter. All right, everybody. Well, I appreciate you hanging out and watching my video and listening to my crazy stories and reminiscing. Hopefully uh, you enjoyed yourself. Again, if you like this video, please click on that thumbs up button at the very bottom. It helps me uh, and my channel a little bit and uh, lets me know that you enjoyed the content of what I put together for you today. So uh, with that, I'm going to sign off and uh, wish you a great day and stay safe out there. And uh, for all of our first responders, whether you're in the medical profession or working in a grocery store or gas station or police officer or any of those jobs, uh, big kudos to you guys. I really appreciate everything you're doing. Uh, I'm staying safe here at my house, basically trying to flatten this this curve and uh, help you guys out a little bit and make things not so crazy out there. And Lord knows it's already crazy enough as it is. So uh, thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Happy puzzling.